Now next, I would like to introduce Sarah Yardney and Miller Prosser. They are both postdoctoral researchers at the University of Chicago. They have a uh, digital paleography group there, Cedar or Ochre. Um, and I will pass over to them to discuss their current work. And I think they're going to do a shared presentation. So I will pass that on. Thank you. So the, the presentation was prepared um, jointly, but I will be delivering the presentation. Uh, Miller is here as well to answer questions. Should any, should we have time for questions? So first, I'd like to thank the organizers of the symposium for putting together such an exciting event and for inviting us to participate. We're here to give an update on the critical additions for digital analysis and research project, or CEDAR, at the University of Chicago with a focus on the paleographic tools we've been developing over the past year and a half. So I'd like to begin by briefly describing the CEDAR project and its approach to encoding texts. CEDAR brings together software engineers and textual scholars to develop innovative ways of encoding manuscripts for text critical research. The project is built in a database called the Online Cultural and Historical Research Environment, or OCHR, OCHRA is an XML graph database, which provides great flexibility while maintaining computational efficiency. OCHRA was originally developed at the University of Chicago by Sandra and David Schloen to handle archeological data, but it now houses over 50 projects ranging from archeology span to ancient DNA to textual projects like the Chicago Hittite Dictionary and CEDAR. CEDAR is the first project in OCHRA, however, to tackle the problem of comparing manuscripts. Our use of ochre has led to some conceptual innovations in how we encode texts. In print and in nearly all digital representations, texts are structured as static strings of characters. We might call this the document model of textual encoding. In ochre, on the other hand, texts are broken down into characters and even into diacritical marks, each of which is stored as its own discrete item in the database. When a user asks to view a text, ochre assembles these items into words. This we might call the database model of textual encoding. What's really powerful about this model is that the same database items can be used to build different versions of the same text, say a version without vowels and cantillation, or a version that's been damaged, or a version with alternative orthography. What are the implications of the database model for comparing manuscripts? Well, when you compare two versions of a text in print, each exists as a distinct flat object and your eyes go back and forth from one to the other. Commercial software designed for biblical studies, such as Accordance or Logos, reproduces the same conceptual model. The texts are structured in one dimension, and any relationship between them has been created by a programmer, building the same links that your eyes and brain do when you read and print. So Accordance and Logos may exist on screens, but conceptually, they're identical to texts on paper. By contrast, in a database like Ochre, it's as if the texts exist in three dimensions. They become like transparency sheets, and we can compare texts by layering one on top of the other. Furthermore, there's no computational limit to how many texts we can layer. To perform this same comparison using the document model, we would need a giant web of links, 45 links to be precise, just to relate the first word in Genesis 1 in these 10 texts, never mind individual characters, let alone vowels and cantillation. A few more words about data structure. First, textual data in Ochre are organized into two overlapping hierarchies, an epigraphic hierarchy, which is arranged by material and graphical features, such as pages, columns, lines, and characters, and a discourse hierarchy, which is arranged by discursive features, such as sentences, phrases, and words, or for a biblical text, books, chapters, verses, and words. The two hierarchies are related by links that tie each character in the epigraphic hierarchy to a word in the discourse hierarchy. Second, texts in Cedar are highly atomized. For example, this is the first character in the Masoretic text of Genesis 1, a bet with a dagesh and a schwa. In Ochre, the bet, the dagesh, and the schwa are each separate database items with their own unique identification numbers. They're nested in the epigraphic hierarchy under a combining sign, an epigraphic unit that combines all three elements. This degree of atomization makes it possible to compare manuscripts in great detail and with great flexibility. Which brings me to the main topic of my presentation today, CEDAR's tools for paleographic analysis and reconstruction. These tools rely on the ability to integrate text and images, which we achieve through our atomized and flexible data model. 
The process begins by uploading images of a manuscript to the OPER database, such as this image of 4Q52, also known as 4Q Samuel B, and linking them to a transcription of the manuscript created by a researcher. The researcher can then draw polygons directly on the image and link those regions to characters or words in the transcription. We call this process hotspotting. Here, the gray polygons are the hotspots drawn by the researcher, in this case, me. The little red characters in square script show which character each hotspot is linked to. And clicking on any character in either the transcription or the image brings up the yellow highlighting that you see. This tool is already useful for documenting readings of damaged manuscripts. But what gets really exciting for paleography is what we can do with the hotspots we've created. First, I'd like to show you the various kinds of letter charts we can produce and then how we can test reconstructions directly on images of a damaged manuscript. The integration we've created between text and image allows us to produce letter charts that are data rich, interactive, comprehensive, and accurate. These charts can be displayed in two different formats and can draw from a single manuscript or multiple manuscripts. So here is one format showing all that's drawn from a single manuscript, 4Q52, 4Q Samuel B. This chart displays every aleph that I've hotspotted in 4Q52, along with its location in the manuscript by fragment and, num and line number, and the word it belongs to. Uh, the table can be sorted by column. So here I've sorted it by location, so we can see all the characters in each fragment group together. And here I've sorted it by word, so we're seeing all the word initial alephs first. Um, and the hotspots here are smaller because they come from an older, lower resolution photograph. This format is particularly useful when you want quick access to information about the context of the character. For example, if you're looking at how a scribe's hand changes in different contexts. So here's a second format, again, drawing just from 4Q52. This one is much denser and lets you see many more exemplars at one time, but we haven't lost the connection to all the data you could see in the previous format. So clicking on any of these exemplars brings up an image of the entire fragment with the character highlighted so you can find it. And another click brings up a transcription of the manuscript. You can see exactly where this olive came from and what's around it. Um, as a side note, if you look at the transcription, you'll see that I've chosen to display it in two different ways. On the left, it's displayed by fragment and line, and on the right, it's displayed by chapter and verse. I apologize, but that's small on everybody's screens. This dual view is enabled by our data structure. The left view represents the epigraphic hierarchy, and the right view represents the discourse hierarchy. You'll also notice that the highlighting is synchronized across both views and the image. So we've got the Aleph, the Aleph, and the word Viomer highlighted. Um, this is really helpful when reading fragmentary manuscripts, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, where a passage is often spread across multiple fragments that are no longer physically joined. You can click on any word in the discourse view and immediately see exactly where it is on each fragment. We can also produce both kinds of chart with characters taken from multiple manuscripts. So here's the denser chart format with olives from five Dead Sea Scrolls, 4Q Genesis B, 4Q Genesis K, 1Q Daniel A, 4Q Jeremiah B, and 4Q Samuel B. I've restricted the query to characters that I marked as of interest in each manuscript so that I have something manageable to show you. Um, but you could search for all olives across these manuscripts or of course mark a much larger number of exemplars. This chart has all the functionality of the previous one. Clicking on any of these characters will bring up the full image of the manuscript, which can be viewed alongside a transcription. And of course, we can view these same characters in the other chart format as well. These charts offer multiple advantages over the hand-drawn letter charts found in print publications, whose shortcomings Michelle and James kindly set up for us. First, simply by virtue of their format, they can be comprehensive. Even if a paleographer were to hand draw every single aleph in a manuscript, the limitations of needing to fit them in an article or book means that they would never all be printed. Second, these charts offer researchers access to full images and transcriptions of the manuscripts in which the exemplars appear. Again, because of the limits of print, hand-drawn charts frequently do not include this information at all. And even when they do, transcriptions and high-resolution photographs are often not included in the volume, so the researcher has to go hunting for them. Third, these charts are dynamic, both in the sense that they're interactive and in the sense that they're generated on the fly and can be altered using different query criteria. You can search for exactly what you want to see. These qualities make cedar letter charts more powerful and more pragmatic than traditional hand-drawn charts. I'd like to transition now to demonstrating tools for reconstructing damaged manuscripts. These tools allow you to test reconstructions using actual characters from the scribe's own hand 
rather than having to rely on averages or approximations. As such, they represent a significant methodological advance over most previous methods of reconstruction. I'm gonna demonstrate these tools on a fragment of 4Q52. This is our largest fragment from this scroll, numbered fragment six in the DJD volume. Unfortunately, this fragment has gone missing. So it was not re-imaged with the rest of the fragments in the early 20 teens. This infrared photograph from 1958 is our only record of it. So the resolution isn't as high as we would like and there's some shadow around the edges of the parchment. I wanna focus on the end of line eight where the leather has torn horizontally across several letters. Here it is blown up. This is the beginning of 1 Samuel 2836. The DJD editors read this text as Vayomer Lanaar Rutz Kach et Hachitz, whereas MT reads Vayomer Lanaaro Rutz Matza et Hachitzim. A few of the variants in 4Q52 are clear cut. There's obviously no pronominal suffix on Naar, and the plane spelling of Rutz is also legible, um, although it's a little tricky to make out. Here's the Resh. Here's the vav, and here's the tsari. The leather has ripped and shifted slightly, so the top and the bottom of the letter are misaligned. But what about the more damaged letters? The DJD editors cite the targum, the peshitza, and the vulgate as support for their reading, but does the extant ink support it? There are two letter identifications that seem especially problematic to me, the kof and the tav. So I'm going to use the tools in cedar to test them. So I've opened the image in ochre and loaded the reconstruction tool. So here on the right side, you see all of the hotspotted characters from this fragment. I'm going to filter the list by sign so I see only the kofs. And then I'm gonna drag and drop a few onto the image so I can see them in context. Now I can increase the opacity to see them more clearly or decrease it so that when I drag the, so I, when I drag one over the fragment, I can still see what's underneath it. It's still hard to distinguish the test character from what's under it, so I'm going to adjust it to make it easier to see. So first, uh, once it pops up, there we go. So first I can modify the threshold at which the computer identifies ink versus background. You can see what happens when I take it too far. I'm gonna back it up a bit. Now I've picked up some unwanted pixels, so I'm going to erase them. I could also uh, add pixels if I had missed some. I also have the option to rotate the character if necessary, which I don't need to do in this case. Now I'm gonna choose a bright color that will stand out against the grayscale background. I like to use red. And finally, I'm gonna bring down the opacity so we can see through the character. I click apply, and now I have my adjusted kof on my image of the fragment. And you can see quite clearly that it isn't a good fit for the space or the extant ink. I'm gonna quickly go through the same steps for tav, dragging and dropping a few onto the image, but we can already see that the shape and the ductus are problems adjusting one and laying it over the fragment where we can see that indeed it isn't a good fit for the ink. Um, I know the image quality isn't great. So here it is closer up. This manuscript does not say kach et as the, DJ, et, as the DJD editors posit. I wish I could tell you what it does say. Um, that's gonna have to wait for another paper. But um, I, I do wanna point out that we could keep using these exact same tools, um, not only to highlight problems with this reconstruction, but to propose a new reconstruction as well. The ability to layer examples of the scribes on writing directly over a damaged manuscript is an enormous advance in the study of ancient texts. Rather than attempting to estimate visually or mathematically whether a character would fit a given location, we can test proposed readings in a controlled and methodologically rigorous way. I wanna emphasize that scholarly judgment is still required. The software does not match characters or suggest reconstructions, and this is a strength of the system. The tools available in CEDAR don't reduce the skill or agency of the researcher in any way. They simply enable her to do her work with greater precision and efficiency. This concludes our update on the CEDAR project. We're very excited about where the project is going, and we thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Sarah. Really appreciate it. It's nice to see the progress you've made since we last met. Um, it was a year or two ago, I think. So very nice, the developing tools.
Um, thank you very much, everybody. It's been a great session. We went a couple minutes over. I want to um, let Laden Popovich have the final word uh, in just a minute here. Uh, thank you so much. Tomorrow we will be back at one o'clock again, Central European Standard Time. Laden, if you're ready, take us away. Yes. Thank you very much, Drew. I will just keep it very brief at the end of a, a wonderful first day. Uh, it's a great first day of the conference. And I want to say thank you to the presenters and the participants for great uh, presentations and wonderful discussions. Uh, I think showing nicely how the disciplines can collaborate together and move the field forward, understanding what each can bring and can do, and also what they cannot do. And I very much look forward to continuing tomorrow. I wish uh, all of you uh, a great day, whether a long day in the US, uh, a short evening in Israel or here in Europe. And I look forward to seeing all of you again tomorrow. Thank you very, very much. See you tomorrow. Thank you.